<laughs> Sorry, everyone, for that. <laughs> anyway, it's nice to be here, and I, I appreciate this opportunity. So here's what we're going to do today, and it's really about asking a question to the audience. I mean, presenting some information, but presenting a question to the audience that I think our whole society needs to address and think about. And, and really, the question is this. We have, you know, we have a certain conception around mental disorders and that has been with us now for more than 40 years. And, and that has been a disease model that really has made drugs at the sort of the first line form of, of therapy or of treatment. And so the question I'm going to be asking you here today is this. Do we keep on doing what we've been doing? In other words, we have 45 years of doing this certain conception and certain way of treating mental disorders, or do we do something radically different? And I think you can see why this is an important, um, an important topic, because <clears throat> when you look at a society and, and, and sort of judge a society, one of the ways to judge it is how well does it help people in distress? How does it nurture people in distress and help them back to health? And really, it's in some ways it is. It's a it's a question about are we a, are we a, a nurturing society? Are we a society that helps people who who are in difficulties, or do we really have a society that, in some ways, um, puts other interests ahead of the interests of the the people who are struggling? So I'm gonna. I still have a little problem with my how I'm what I'm seeing here. All right. Anyway. What what are you seeing, Robert? We see um, the slide. The question we need to address. Yeah, I, I'm seeing uh, you know other things over my slide is what the problem is. Um, you can probably close them out. Are, what are you? What are those things that you're seeing? Well, like uh, na your names, uh, menu bar on the top instead of the bottom. Oh, I just moved it there. That's good. Okay, now I'm getting it better. Okay. You could hide that menu bar by going to the right. There's three uh, dots on the right-hand side, and you uh, click the three dots, and it will say "Hide Menu Bar." And then, if you wanted to get the menu bar back, you just hit Escape. Okay. All right. For some reason, that's not coming up. I'm sorry about this. For some reason, it's a little different. No worries. Um, do, I don't know if you want to hit uh, View on the right hand upper right hand corner. There's a View button of in Zoom, and you can hit full screen. That might help. See, that's what I'm not seeing right now. I don't know what. Usually, I see this. Hold on. No, that's okay. Okay. Let me just get get going. I'm sorry about this, folks. No worries. How's that? Is that still showing up? Okay um not so much not not as not as good yeah not really let's, as good. Go to, let's go back to full screen okay here we go all right so thinking about what the conceptions we have today where did they come from they, we have a disease model of care and it really originates in 1980 when the american psychiatric association published the third edition of the diagnostic and statistical manual and you'll see here a quote from jeffrey lieberman who's the former president of the American Psychiatric Association, he says, DSM-3 was the book that changed everything. And I agree with him because it became a new way, it provided a new way for us to think about ourselves. In fact, Jeffrey Lieberman at one point said, this is the most important, um, this is the most important book published in the last 50 years. And I actually agree with him. And he, he meant, he didn't mean just in psychiatry, he meant any book that was published in, in our literature, still trying to, trying to get something here. Sorry, guys. Um, and I agree with him that this, because this has changed how we think about ourselves, how we raise our kids. It was a profoundly, it, it presented a profoundly different way for us to think about ourselves and how, and how we treat each other. Well, I'm having trouble today. Okay. So now let's look at where we, we, we started with this. Where did this arise, the DSM-3, this disease model? There was two impulses that were present in the 1970s that led to the publication of DSM-3 in 1980. The first 
was indeed an honest scientific impulse. So you had with DSM-1 and DSM-2, those were the first two editions of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. You had a problem in that the, the diagnoses were seen as not reliable. In other words, a patient would go to one psychiatrist and get one diagnosis, and then I'd go to a different diag a psychiatrist and get a different diagnosis. And they often also weren't seen as valid. They weren't validated disorders. One disorder wasn't really that different from another. So the scientific thought was, the impulse was, let's do some research and see if we can categorize these different sort of manifestations of psychiatric distur disturbances into discrete categories, psychosis, affective disorder, depression, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea initially was maybe they would have 15, 18 categories, and they try to do the research and see in what ways they separated out as distinct difficulties. But there was another impulse present with the uh, in the 1970s that really affected, really became the guiding thing in terms of what drove the creation of DSM-3. And that was this. During the 1970s, Psychiatry as an organization felt it was under attack. It was fighting for its very survival. You had uh, the anti-psychiatry movement that arose in the 1960s, really within academia, which said that psychiatrists don't function as a, they don't function as a, a, a medical discipline. They're really functioning as an organization or, or, uh, 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 for the purpose of social control. That was their, what they were really serving as. That was number one. Number two, there was an uh, anti -psych there was a psychiatric survivor movement that was rising up in the 1970s that said listen we want to be we want to be free of psychiatric care we we want to be on our own and we feel that we were harmed within psych within the mental hospitals not help so there was that patient revolt and then finally the big drugs of the 1960s and 1970s were the benzodiazepines those were the most popular new psychiatric drugs and they were understood by the late 1970s to, to be causing addiction. They didn't work very long. Um, people had trouble getting off them. They were even compared in some instances to heroin. So you had all of these things in which that were sort of challenging the place of psychiatry in our society. Oh, and by the way, there was one other uh, thing going on. So before this time, you know, one of the things that psychiatry did was with sort of Freudian ideas was psychotherapy on the couch, psychoanalysis. But in the 1970s, what was happening is they could improve, psychiatry could improve their psychotherapy was any more effective than the counseling or by psychologists or other mental health professionals. So there was also this competition going on for, for patients in the 1970s as well. So if you go back and look in the archives of the American Psychiatric Association and, and, and its discussions at this time, here's what they said. They said, we need to reinvent ourselves. We need to uh, change public's perception of us. And, and we need to present ourselves as a real medical discipline. And they said, well, what? because they understood that the doctor in white coats has such scientific prestige in our society. So they said, that's what we need to do. We need to present ourselves as doctors in white coats that treat real, real physical disorders. In other words, they're going to change themselves from the, the, the perception or there's of psychiatrists at this time was more about the, the Freudian doctor who stroked his beard and, and had a patient on the couch. They're going to change it from that conception. Oh, and the other conception, by the way, was a medical uh, was a superintendents at mental hospitals, such as uh, we saw in the uh, book, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest in that movie, which also made fun of psychiatrists. So they're going to say, we got to get rid of that image. And we got to newly present ourselves as doctors in white coats as if we're treating infectious diseases. And of course, um, you know, if you go back in the history of medicine, one of the great advances was the introduction of antibiotics in the 1940s and early 1950s. And that's just when you get this elevation of doctors to this very prestigious place in our society. And that's what psychiatry wanted to take advantage of. We're going to be doctors in white coats. So what did they say? How do we do this? 
we need to adopt what they call the medical model, but it's really a disease model. They're going to say, we, we are a medical specialist that treats diseases of the brain. And you'll see here what the uh, statement is. He says, there is a boundary between the normal and the sick. It is the task of scientific psychiatry as a medical specialty to investigate the causes, diagnosis, and treatment of those mental dis mental of these mental illnesses. So this is where they're putting the stake in the ground and saying, this is how we're going to present ourselves to society. So um, remember when I said that the idea with the scientific impulse is maybe they would find 18, 12 to 18 categories of, of psychiatric difficulties, and they would try to establish, they would do research to see in what ways they might be discrete. Well, by the time with this with this guild impulse, this commercial impulse in play, the DSM-3 had 265 disorders. Now, why did it have so many disorders? Well, basically, they wanted a, uh, a, a definition that it would allow anybody who came into their office to be diagnosed with a psychiatric disorder. So that's why you have this extraordinary expansion of the number of disorders. And here's the conception. Now, this was written by Nancy Andreessen. She was the long-term editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Psychiatry, and she's presenting this new present, this new conception to the public in a book called The Broken Brain, 1984. The major psychiatric illnesses are diseases. They should be considered medical illnesses, just as diabetes, heart disease, and cancer are. The thought is that each different illness has a different specific cause. There are many hints that mental illness is due to chemical imbalances in the brain, and that treatment involves correcting these chemical imbalances. To understand what a big shift this is, if you go back before 1980, the conception was that human beings are responsive to their environments. And in the Freudian idea, so often is the difficulties are in reaction. They have their reactions to difficulties in the environment. They might be family, they might be uh, poverty, there might be social conditions, there might be instances of grief, that sort of thing. But so much of, not all, there was still a thought that there's a small core of biological disorders, but so much was thought of, we humans are responsive to our environments. And when things are difficult in our environment, that's when we get these, these eruptions of psychiatric distress. But this is different now. Now this is going to, so that's a, that's a vision in which you have people interacting with your environment. Here's a vision where, or a conception where everything in fact is happening inside the head of the individual. They have an illness, there's something chemically wrong with them. It's no longer an adaption to adoption or adaption to the environment. And if this is so, if there's something chemically wrong, you're adopting a model that says this is gonna be a chronic illness. It's gonna persist in you because in the person because they have this chemical abnormality. So this is a huge shift. And the other part of this disease model is they're already hinting that maybe we have drugs that can fix that chemical imbalance, that problem. So you see here, Robert Spitzer, who was the head of the DSM-3 task force. In other words, he was the head of the, the main, the lead of the person when they, when the American Psychiatric Association reconceived psychiatric difficulties. And he says, the pharmaceuticals were delighted. Now, why are they delighted? Because what did they, in order to get a drug approved for the market, it has to be a treatment for an illness, a disease. You can't get a drug to treat unhappiness, or a, 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 but you can get a drug to treat depression or anxiety when it's seen as an illness. So what they understood that pharmaceutical companies are going to take all these sort of <clears throat> discomforts that people regularly experienced in, the, in, in, in society, which were seen as maybe episodic, just part of life, anxiety, depressive episodes, that sort of thing. And they're gonna put all those difficulties into the illness category, and now they can get FDA approval for drugs to treat those illnesses. Whereas before, there was no way to say, to get a drug approved for someone who's unhappy. That's the big shift here. So what was the narrative we were told once DSM-3 was published? And this is the narrative that we organized our thinking around. It is one, 
Major mental illnesses like depression, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia are due to chemical imbalances in the brain. These illnesses are partly genetic in kind. The diagnoses tell of discrete validated illnesses. Psychiatric drugs, and in particular antidepressants and antipsychotics, fix chemical imbalances in the brain like insulin for diabetes. And then we get a second generation of psychiatric drugs. That's the SSRI antidepressants, the atypical antipsychotics. They're very safe and effective and their use is necessary and promotes long-term recovery. Now, this is a narrative of an extraordinary medical and scientific advance. We are being told that psychiatric researchers have discovered the very molecules that cause depression, the very molecule that causes madness, the very molecule that causes bipolar disorder. And most remarkably, New drugs are coming on market that can fix those molecules, those abnormalities, in the same way that insulin does for diabetes. It's an antidote to that abnormality. Now, if this were true, I would say this is the greatest medical discovery in history, given the, given the complexity of the human brain. And so that's just the narrative we're, we're told. We start thinking of our children in this way, oh, if they're having difficulties, they have, might have a chemical imbalance. We think of ourselves in this way. Oh, if I'm depressed, it's because I have a chemical imbalance and on and on. This is our new conception. And we're going to organize our thinking and our care around this conception. So now that takes hold in 1980. In 1987, Prozac comes to market. This is the first SSRI. And this is hailed as a breakthrough medication precisely because it fixes a chemical imbalance in the brain. We, of course, get other SSRIs. Then in the 1990s, we get atypical antipsychotics, drugs like Zyprexa, Risperdal. These two are said to fix chemical imbalances in the brain. They're presented as breakthrough medications. You can read articles in the newspapers about how now with these new drugs, people with schizophrenia are going back to work like never before. They can live normal lives. And so we are now in this era, theoretically, within the media of these great advances. The chemical imbalance story has been found to be true. We have drugs that fix these chemical imbalances. And this leads, by the way, to this great expansion of the psychiatric enterprise. So whereas before it would be a smaller group of people were said to suffer from a mental illness in any one year, all of a sudden we were hearing that 15, 20% of the population suffers from a psychiatric disorder at any one time. And of course, we start hearing that our children can suffer from ADHD, which was newly, in, which was a new creation in the 1980 um, DSM-3. And just to give you an example of the expansion of this enterprise, in 1987, when, when Prozac came to market, we as a country were spending about $800 million on psychiatric drugs. Uh, 20 years later, we were spending 40 billion dollars on psychiatric drugs. That's a 50-fold increase in the market for psychiatric drugs in 20 short years. And that's what this narrative helped fuel. But now our next part of this, this thought is, let's look and see, well, is it a true narrative? Did science actually support this narrative? And the first thing to do is to look at the chemical imbalances, since that's at the heart of this narrative. And what you find is this, first of all, where did the chemical imbalance story arise from? It didn't arise from discoveries of, of, of such a problem in people so diagnosed. It arose from an understanding of how drugs acted on the brain. So, for example, in the 1960s, they came to understand that antipsychotics blocked dopamine receptors in the brain. This is the first generation of antipsychotics like um, Thorazine and Haldol. So since the drugs block dopamine receptors, they thwarted dopamine transmission in the brain, the idea was that psychosis or schizophrenia must be too, too much dopamine. At the same time, they found that the first uh, antidepressants, what they did is they, um, they lowered, they, they lowered, they upped, excuse me, <laughs> what they did is they up serotonergic activity in the brain. And here's how neuro neurotransmitters, uh, how neurons transmit messages. You have a presynaptic neuron, which releases a neurotransmitter, a molecule like serotonin, a chemical messenger, into the tiny gap between neurons, which is called the synaptic cleft. 
Those molecules bind with receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. And we say they fit like a key into a lock. And that's, that's that binding that allows for a message to pass along, say a serotonergic uh, pathway or a dopaminergic pathway. Now, in order for that messaging system to be crisp, you have to remove that molecule from the receptors and from the synaptic cleft very quickly. And that removal is done of one of two ways. Either it goes back up into the presynaptic neuron versus reuptake channels, or an enzyme comes along and metabolizes that and the, and the metabolites are, are carted off as waste. Those are two ways you remove serotonin from the synaptic cleft. What they understood is that the new drugs um, block that normal reuptake or that normal metabolization process. So now serotonin and, and what are called monoamines stay longer in the synaptic cleft. You're upping serotonergic activity. So the, now the thought is um, depression is due to too little serotonin. So the origins of the chemical imbalance story arise from an understanding of how drugs perturb normal neurotransmitter functioning and a hypothesis that the, that the, that the illnesses themselves or the disorders themselves are characterized by the opposite of that action. So that's what the hypothesis is in the 60s and the 70s. But now they have to see, do people with depression, do they have low serotonin activity prior to going on an antidepressant? Well, there's a long history of this research. In 1984, the NIMH, National Institute of Mental Health, which is our leading research institution in the United States, says this about it. Elevations or decrements in the functioning of serotonin systems per se are not likely to be associated with depression. Now, there was a bunch of, more, there was many other studies into this low serotonin theory in the rest of the 1980s and early 1990s. In 1998, the American Psychiatric Association's own textbook said, that theory is dead. And, and not only did they say it's dead in their own textbook, they said it was sort of not a very valid hypothesis in the first place because there's no reason that the mechanism of action in a disease should be the opposite of what the drug is doing. So believe it or not, the low serotonin theory of depression was basically declared by the American Psychiatric Association itself in its own communications to itself, not in its communications to the public in 1998. And here's a man, Alan Frazier, who spent decades researching this theory, the low serotonin theory of depression. And what does he say? I don't think there's any convincing body of data that anybody has ever found that depression is associated to a significant extent with loss of serotonin. Now, if we go to the, the overactive dopamine theory of schizophrenia, Stephen Hyman, he's also a former director of the NIMH. He says in his book, 2002, there is no compelling evidence that a lesion in the dopamine system is a primary cause of schizophrenia. Now, Kenneth Kendler, he's an editor at Psychological Medicine. He was one of the world leaders in hunting for this whole chemical imbalance story to see if people with psychiatric disorders really had these chemical imbalances. And what did he say in 2005? We have hunted for big, simple neuro neurochemical explanations for psychiatric disorders and have not found them. And then you see Ronald Pies. He's a former editor-in-chief of Psychiatric Times. He's a psychiatrist, well-known psychiatrist. He says in 2011, in truth, the chemical imbalance notion was always a kind of urban legend, never a theory seriously propounded by well-informed psychiatrists. So you see the problem here. We organized our thinking and our sense of self around a story of great medical progress, the chemical imbalance story. That story also fueled our use of drugs because that story says you need the drugs to fix that chemical imbalance and you need them chronically to fix that chemical imbalance. And all the while, if you go into the scientific literature, it was a hypothesis that was failing to pan out. So you see the problem here. We as a society organized our thinking and our conception of psychiatric disorders around a false narrative of scientific advance. Now, I won't go into the search for genes in the same detail. You all, we also, we regularly heard that these were just genetic diseases. 
and that they, because the, there's this genetic component, it, it's, it's one reason people get ADHD, anxiety, depression, and schizophrenia. However, as they were saying this, after they were making these claims, they hadn't actually found any genes for these disorders. And now here's the, uh, the latest big study on this. In a study of 50,000 people, they failed to find any genes that influence mental illness. Here was the conclusion. The results from this study are completely negative. No gene is formally statistically significant after correction for multiple testing. And even those which are ranked highest and lowest do not include any which could be regarded as being biologically plausible candidates. And there was an earlier study that said genetics explain less than 3% of the risk for varying, various psychiatric diagnosis. In other words, what you really see in the genetic literature is this. Our genetic makeup really is at its heart, a way of, of making us responsive to the environment. And in fact, the environment changes genetic expression. Now you might have people who are more sensitive to certain things, less sensitive to certain things, but what they're saying is they never found a gene abnormality of any note that explains why one person gets ADHD, will get diagnosed with ADHD or becomes anxious, depression, et cetera. So this idea of sort of genetic determinism that is presented to us is another false story, okay? Now, how about we heard in the, there were educational campaigns mounted in the 1990s as they were selling their SSRIs and selling their atypical antipsychotics. They said, these are the diseases of the brain. Depression is a disease, a discrete illness, okay? Then we heard that bipolar is a discrete illness and that schizophrenia is a disease, et cetera, et cetera. But then, <clears throat> and that was the thought in 1980. The thought in 1980 when they published DSM-3 was that, in, 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 that, that they, would be, they would find research that would validate these disorders and what research would be genes. They would find that certain, they would find out what is the characteristic long-term course of the disorder. They would find out that different diseases are only responsive to a very specific type of drug. So that was the idea. And we did hear, in fact, that, okay, these are diseases of the brain. But now we go to uh, when they were discussing, in, in, when they were creating the DSM-5, there was a roundtable discussion of the DSM and DSM-3. They, had, they gathered 20 experts in psychiatric diagnosis. And here's what was the conclusion. Virtually all discussants agreed there was no evidence that, they, that these disorders in the DSM had been validated as real diseases. Here's what James Phillips concluded. The startling failure of research to validate the DSM categories of DSM-3 and DSM-4 has led to a conceptual crisis in our nosology. What exactly is the status of DSM diagnoses? And just read, you can read here comments by the, some of the leading figures in American psychiatry. Thomas Insel, when he was director of the NIMH, the strength of each of the editions of DSM has been reliability. Each edition has ensured that clinicians use the same term in the same ways. The weakness is its lack of validity. Next, DSM diagnoses are not useful for research because of their lack of validity. DSM diagnoses have given research as a common nomenclature, but probably the wrong one. This is from the former editor of the American Journal of Psychiatry. You look at the chair of the DSM, DSM task force, DSM-4 task force. Alan Francis, what is he says? These diagnoses are better understood as no more than currently convenient constructs or heuristics that allow us to communicate with one another as we conduct our clinical research, educational, forensic, and administrative work. They are constructs as opposed to diseases in nature. And then you'll find the last one from Joel Paris. He says, in reality, we do not know whether conditions like schizophrenia bipolar disorder or obsessive compulsive disorder are true diseases. So again, you can see the difference between what we were told and what science was telling us. We were told these had been uh, uh, proven to be discrete illnesses. These were diseases of the brain. And that's what you saw in these diagnostic categories. Behind the scenes, they were saying, we're not finding research science that, that identifies these different diagnostic categories as discrete illnesses. So what you see in that brief review is that there's this incredible gap or 
that is out of sync, that that story we were told to us as a, as a population, as a society, was out of sync, completely out of sync. It was belied by the science. So you can see we organized ourselves around a false narrative. Now, there's one other part of this chemical imbalance story that is very important. And it's, 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 it's more than important. It's really disheartening. And it also really is something we need to grapple with, that the profession needs to grapple with and sort of society. So researchers didn't find that before you went on a drug, you had a chemical imbalance in the brain. But as they researched the mechanism of action of these drugs, they also researched how the brain responded to the drug. So for example, you, you are put on an antipsychotic. It blocks your dopamine receptors. Now, the, and the, the, remember the, the idea with schizophrenia was that it was caused by too much dopamine, either too much dopamine release or too many dopamine receptors. So you go on an antipsychotic, it blocks dopamine in the brain and your brain being this very sort of um, uh, neuroplastic organ tries to maintain a, a, a homeostatic, uh, homeostatic equilibrium. It's normal functioning. That's what researchers say. And in order to this, in, in response to this blockade, what does it do? It increases the density of its dopamine receptors. You see this graphic here, which shows brain increases receptors to compensate for drug blockade. This is a graphic from a textbook. So it shows, what are we seeing here? We're seeing that the drugs, in fact, ultimately, A, they perturb normal function. They're not, they're not fixing abnormal function. And B, they eventually create the very abnormality hypothesized to cause the problem in the first place. And so, for example, if you go on an antidepressant, which blocks the normal reuptake of serotonin, so it ups serotonergic activity, what does your brain do? It does the opposite of that, trying to maintain an homeostatic equilibrium. The presynaptic neurons put out less serotonin than normal for a period of time, and the postsynaptic neurons decrease their density of, of, of receptors for serotonin. So antidepressants, in essence, drive your brain into a low serotonergic state. Now, away from the public eye, within the science literature, there are explorations of this fact, this, this fact that drugs cause this, quote, oppositional tolerance. And what they're doing is, in away from the public eye, is they tie it to worsening outcomes. They're saying this is the reason we're getting such poor long-term outcomes. Now, Rifael Malik, he was someone who once worked for a drug company. He's an expert in mood disorders. And he published this in 2011. Continued drug treatment may induce processes that are the opposite of, of what the medication originally produced. This may cause a worsening of the illness continued for a period of time after discontinuation of the medication, which is why you may have withdrawal effects, and may not be reversible. So the worry here is that with long-term use of these drugs, you may induce brain changes that A, make it, you start becoming more chronically ill, have worse symptoms. You're gonna have trouble getting off the drug because your brain has become used to the drug. And here's the real frightening part. In some instances, your brain not be, may not be able to renormalize itself, and therefore you may need to stay on the drug forever. This is part of the story, of course, that is never told to the public, because if it was communicated to the public, we would have a public discussion about, well, should we be using these drugs long term? Or we would have to re completely rethink the use of these drugs. And obviously, there are commercial interests that prevent that from happening. So we've now looked at how the drugs act on the brain, how the brain responds to that. But now we can look at, well, what sort of outcomes are we seeing in the modern era, in the disease model era? Now, if for some reason, this, this, this perturbation of normal functioning of, of neurotransmitters in the brain somehow led to better outcomes, okay, that could be fine. That's what it helped people lead, you know, 
get freed of symptoms, lead better lives, function better and stuff. If that's what our research is showing us, okay, that's great. And, and by the way, I just want to go back to one thought. In 1996, Stephen Hyman, when he was director of the uh, National Institute of Mental Health, he wrote a paper called, I forget, uh, he wrote a paper called A Paradigm for Understanding Psycho Psychiatric dr Psychotropic Drugs. And he says, all these drugs work by perturbing normal neurotransmitter functioning, which triggers a series of compensatory adaptations. And the brain at the end of this compensatory process is operating in a manner that is both qualitatively and quantitatively different than normal. So we have drugs that abnormalize brain function. And the hope is, or the thought is that somehow that that process will lead to better outcomes for people suffering from psychiatric distress. Well, let's look at the best long-term study, first of all, schizophrenia of psychotic patients. It was done by Martin Harrow and Thomas Job at the, uh, in Illinois, University of Illinois. Martin Harrow was a psychologist. Thomas Job was a psychiatrist. And here's what's the, their study. And it started in the late 1970s. They enrolled 200 patients from one from a private hospital, one from a public hospital. That way we want a diversity of class. And all the patients are just going to be treated normally in the hospital with antipsychotics. Then they're going to be discharged. And Harrow and Job are then going to follow them up at two years. How are they doing? At four and a half years, how are they doing? At seven and a half, at 10, 15, 20. And in each follow-up, they're going to see, are they taking antipsychotics? Are they symptomatic? And how are they functioning? Work, that sort of thing. Are they psychotic, et cetera? And one of the great things about this, you'll see this, at the end of 15 years, they still had 145 of their patients in the study. That's very good. 64 were schizophrenia patients and 81 were patients with milder psychotic disorders. Now, the other good thing about this, they're getting people early on in their, they're, they're not chronic patients they're starting with. They're mostly starting with either first hospitalizations or second hospitalizations. It's a young group. So they're going to be able to follow these people starting from when, when the problems first arose for them, okay, by and large. Now, their hypothesis was that the patients who stayed on antipsychotics would have better outcomes because that was the conventional belief. Now, at the end of two years, in the uh, 60, among the schizophrenia patients, 25 of the uh, 64 had gotten off antipsychotics, and the recovery rate for them was 20% versus about 7% for those on antipsychotics. Now, what did it mean to be in recovery in this study? You had to be asymptomatic. You had to be working or in school. Not, you know, in other words, you had to, have, this is a functional thing. You had to have a, a good uh, and a pretty good uh, social, something of a social life as well. So it wasn't just symptoms. It was also, how are you functioning? Now look in this graphic and see what happens between year two and four and a half. Which group continues to get better? the off antipsychotic group. And so we see in this group a time of recovery. Now it's over a longer period of time when people off antipsychotics, many of them can get much, much better and start to be well. And this is missed, completely missed by the, the evidence base for antipsychotics. The evidence base for antipsychotics is two things. One, you do short-term trials where you take people who are on medications. One group is taken off and that becomes your placebo group. The other group is either put on a new medication or stayed on. And over the short term, there's a greater uh, reduction of symptoms in those treated with antipsychotics. And then you also have, well, should you stay on antipsychotics? And basically there's the same design. You take people on drugs and you randomize either one group to a withdrawal or the other group to staying on. And over the next few months, the group withdrawn relapses at a higher rate. And that becomes evidence quote for maintaining people on the drugs. But you look at the timing of those studies, one is six weeks in length, the other is basically the six months after withdrawal, neither one captures this capacity for recovery over the long term. So you'll see that long term, the recovery rate for schizophrenia off medication was eight times higher than for those on. At any one time, those off medication were six more times more likely to be in recovery at any time during the study. Look at the psychotic symptoms. Those who got off by year two and stayed off for the, for the rest of the study, their psychotic symptoms actually abated as, as during year two 
to four and a half. And eventually they became very, very stable with very few relapses. Well, look at those who are always on antipsychotics. Basically two thirds were, were you know, chronically psychotic. And why might that be? What Harrow and Job said is, we think it's because the drugs by increasing dopamine receptors, which is called in, inducing a dopamine supersensitivity, are actually increasing the patient's biological vulnerability to psychosis. How about work? Look at the percentage of people off antipsychotics who worked versus those who were on. And what did they conclude? I conclude that patients with schizophrenia not on antipsychotic medication for a long period of time have significantly better global functioning than those on antipsychotics. This is the best long-term study that has been done in the modern era, and that was the conclusion. Now, there have been now six other studies from other countries that have studied outcomes for schizophrenia or psychotic patients over the longer term, say 10 years, seven years. And in each one, the recovery rate for those who got off medication was higher than for those who stayed on. And that that difference in outcomes is not explained by any difference in severity of illness. So we now have seven studies that say, if people get off, which might be seen as the natural course of the disorder, you're seeing higher recovery rates than those who stay within the system and, and continually take antipsychotics. It's notable that uh, recovery rates have actually declined in the modern era since when the uh, Atypicals arrive in 1990s. Look at it's now 1996, down to 6%. Look at, and that 6% is what Harrow was seeing in his study, by the way. This is an international study. So think about this. We had a story that said the atypicals are leading to people going back to work and recovering like never before. The actual data said our recovery rates were now the for schizophrenic patients so diagnosed were the worst they've ever been. You also see now in the modern era that mortality rates have worsened in the atypicals era. And what you're seeing here is sort of the risk of death in people treated with antipsychotics compared to the risk of death of a, a similar group in the population without that diagnosis. And so you'll see from 2004 to 2014 that that risk has steadily increased, that mortality risk. And here was, these are studies of during, conducted at a different time of what's called the standardized mortality rate in the 1970s to 1990s. The rate for schizophrenia patients was about three times. Today, it's more anywhere from four to six times, four to five times. In other words, there's been this increase in mortality, standard mortality rate in the modern times. So that's the psychotic story. That's the schizophrenia story. Now let's look quickly at the natural, what happened, how did antidepressants affect uh, the natural course of depression? And one of the things to understand here is when you're trying to assess how a treatment or a drug treatment uh, affects people over the long term, you have to have some understanding of the natural course of depression. What happens if you don't treat it with the drug? So if you do that, if you go, antidepressants get introduced in the late 50s, but they really take off in the 80s. But what you see here in, in early studies in the first half of the 20th century, when you look at people hospitalized with depression, this is severe depression, you find here's the sort of spectrum of outcomes. First of all, 80 to 85% would be discharged within a year. In other words, there was a natural recovery rate because this is before the antidepressants. And then if you followed a cohort of first episode depressed patients hospitalized for depression, you'd find that their long-term outcomes were sort of like this. Around 50% would, would have um, only that single episode, they'd be discharged and they'd never become depressed enough again to return to the hospital. You'd have another 30% or so who might have another episode every three, four years, okay? And then you might have 20% who become chronically ill. And you can see this in these different studies from different countries. Look at the one by Pollock. This is the long, the biggest study in the United States at this time. Half of those admitted had but a single attack of depression and only 17% had three or more episodes. That would be your chronic group, something similar in Sweden. So in 1972, 
Samuel Goose and Eli Robbins of Washington University. And this was the group that was behind creating DSM-3. They reviewed the outcomes literature for depression and concluded that in follow-up studies that lasted 10 years, 50% of people hospitalized for depression had no recurrence of their illness. Only about 10% became chronically ill. These are the people that researchers that looked at the review of the literature, not me, and that was their conclusion about depression. Now read what our understanding of depression was in the 1960s and 1970s. Depression is on the whole, one of the psychiatric conditions with the best prognosis for eventual recovery with or without treatment. Jonathan Cole, he was head of the NIMH's Psychopharmacology Service Center. Most depressions are self-limited. George Winokur, also a big uh, expert in mood disorders. Assurance can be given to a patient and to his family that subsequent Ill episodes of illness, God, I, 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 that needed to, there's a typo there, after a first mania or a first depression will not tend toward a more chronic course, not a chronic illness. Head of the depression section, Dean Schuyler said, most depressive episodes will run their course and terminate with virtually complete recovery without specific intervention. With this understanding of depression, the idea with antidepressants was you could speed up a normal recovery process because being depressed for six months, eight months was a long time to be depressed. You weren't going to improve on that, but hopefully you can speed it up. That was the thought. What happened though, in the 1970s, you start seeing clinicians saying this, well, maybe my depressed patients are now getting better faster, but it seems treated with antidepressants, but it seems now that they're, be they're becoming more chronically ill. They're staying ill. So they're causing a chronification of the disease. And now in the 1980s, you start seeing that uh, researchers are looking, well, what is the course of medicated depression? And you see, here's the new spectrum of outcomes. One third of responders to initial treatment, half of this group, if maintained on depression, will stay well, in other words, 16%. One third are partial responders to initial treatment. This is a first step toward a more severe relapsing and chronic course. And one third are non responders and have a poor long term outcome. In other words, suddenly depression was seen as with antidepressants, about one in six stays well long term, and the others start to become with, with treatment with uh, antidepressants become so, sort of chronically symptomatic. We did a, this largest antidepressant trial ever conducted. It's called the STAR-D trial. It, the idea was that this will be a study funded by the NIMH, which shows that in regular clinical care, we can help people get care and stay, stay well, uh, get well and stay well. So people were treated with antidep uh, initial antidepressant. If that one didn't work, they could be switched to a second antidepressant. If that didn't work, a third one and given psychotherapy, they were given four top fries to remit, 1,518 remitted. Then those who remitted were, that means they got better be below a certain uh, scale. And then you see of that group, they were switched to a, a one-year follow-up study where they could be continually treated. And so how many were well at the end of one year? 108. That's a 3% stay well rate in the largest antidepressant trial ever conducted. And you'll see then uh, of the group that either never remitted, relapsed or dropped out was the remaining 97%. This is the worst outcome for depressed patients I've ever seen in the literature. Now, at the same time, the NIMH did a study of unmedicated depression. And what do you see? That you see the recovery rate, just like in the old days, one month, 23% better, but they kept getting better. And at the end of 12 months, 85% were better. So here's what the researcher wrote. Preplin, that's in the old days, found that depressive episodes usually cleared up within six to eight months. And these results provided the most methodologically rigorous confirmation of this estimate. And he said, if as many as 85% of depressed individuals who go without somatic treatment spontaneously recover, it would be extremely difficult for any intervention to demonstrate a superior result to this. So what you see is confirmation of that old way of untreated depressive episodes versus treated, and you see it's much worse today. Now I'm running a little bit slow. I'm just gonna go real quickly here. Even bipolar, we used to be seen as a episodic disorder, something with 50% 
of those suffer the hospital for manic depressive would never would be discharged and never suffer a second attack. Only 20%, three or more episodes. It's the same thing, basically. 50% would get well, never have a second attack. There might be 30% that have occasionally have an attack, attack. It was still seen as episodic. And it was very few that required a long-term hospitalization. You'll see that in back then, before the drugs, 80, 70, 80% would be socially recovered and resume their former positions. They'd go back to maybe married. They live in their own homes. They work. That was manic depressive illness before the introduction of psychiatric drugs. You'll see here in this description, there's no cons basis to consider that manic depressive psychosis permanently affected those who suffered from it. Each episode is usually only a few months in duration, significant number of patients only one episode. And once they recover, they have no difficulty resuming their usual occupation. Then in 2007, Ross Paul de Serini summarized the change in outcomes. And what did he say? There used to be recovery to euthymia, favorable functional adaptation. Now there's slow or incomplete recovery, continued risk of recurrences, and sustained morbidity over time. Before 85% of patients would regain complete pre-morbid functioning, return to work, now only a third do. Before bipolar patients didn't show cognitive impairment over the long term, now they end up nearly impaired as those with schizophrenia. In sum, prognosis for bipolar disorder was once considered relatively favorable, but contemporary findings suggest that disability and poor outcomes are prevalent. And here's my favorite part, despite major therapeutic advances. In other words, things have gotten worse as we, we medicated uh, bipolar disorder. And obviously right now we use a lot of polypharmacy. This just shows you uh, disability due to mood disorders with the introduction of the antidepressants. The, I'm talking about the SSRIs, and look what happens. As you get more and more people uh, using antidepressants, the number on government disability due to mood disorders rose in lockstep. And from 1994 to 2013, the number of people on government disability due to mood disorders increased fivefold. At the same time, that increase of the antidepressants increased fivefold. Now, if you see that antidepressants cause induce a, a, a change of the course to a more chronic course, you can see why that would lead to more disability. Suicide has also increased uh, in, the, in the modern era with increased use of antidepressants. You'll see the suicide rate and the antidepressant usage. In order to move on, I, I have to go sort of go a little bit quicker. Just in the 1990s, the NIMH mounted what's called the MTA multi-site multimodal treatment study of children with ADHD. And they said, this is going to be the first good study of treating children diagnosed with ADHD with stimulants. So this, and this is going to tell us whether we're doing, uh, if we're providing them with a benefit over the long term. And I note that before this, we have no evidence that stimulants provide a long-term benefit in any domain of functioning. And what happened was, real quickly, the kids were diagnosed, they were randomized either to drug prescribed by um, an expert, drug prescribed in the community, drug plus behavioral therapy or behavioral therapy alone. And those randomized to the one group with drug as prescribed by experts they had a greater reduction in uh, core ADHD symptoms and there was a hint that medicated children also did better on reading tests. And this became the study said, oh, this is why we have to medicate kids with ADHD chronically, persistently, because it's an ongoing, it's, it, they provide a long-term benefit. That, that result is still communicated to the public. Here's what's not communicated is at the end of three years, medication use was a significant marker, not a beneficial outcome, but of deterioration. Those using drugs actually showed increased symptomatology turned to those not taking medication. They were also now slightly smaller and higher delinquency scores. You now have a result telling a, a drug treatment that's making kids worse. Six year results, medication use associated with worse hyperactivity, impulsivity and oppositional defiant disorder and with greater overall functional impairment. Three and six year results are never told to the public. 
And you'll see the conclusion. We had thought that children medicated longer would have better outcomes. That didn't happen to be the case. No beneficial effects, none. In the short term, medication will help the child behave better. In the long run, it won't. And that information should be made very clear to parents. It, of course, is not. Instead, we hear about how ADHD is a genetic disorder, it's a brain disorder, and you need the, uh, the drugs. Real quickly, there was a Western Australia study, long-term study, and they also found negative outcomes for those medicated ADHD children. They were 10 times more likely to be identified as performing below age level in their schoolwork, worse ADHD symptoms, elevated blood pressure, Conclusion, medication does not translate into long-term benefits to the child's social and emotional outcomes, school-based performance or symptom improvements. There was a study of long-term outcomes in Quebec. It was the same. When we return, when we turn to an examination of long-term outcomes, we find that increases in medic use are associated with increases in the probability that boys dropped out of school and with marginal increases in the probability that girls have ever been diagnosed with a mental or emotional disorder, a worsening of outcomes outcomes. And here's the disability data in 1988. This is uh, when Prozac comes to market. And this is during the era we started diagnosing our kids with ADHD, depression, juvenile bipolar disorder. It did not happen before 1980. And what do you see? In 1987, there were 16,600 children who received a government disability payment, or the parents did or guardians did, due to mental illness. By 2011, it was around 700,000 children who were receiving, who were on government disability due to mental illness. And if you follow those children to age 18 who get on government disability as children, about two thirds go on to adult disability. So you see here a new career path for children who are diagnosed, given drugs, said to be disabled by it, and then you're really creating a path towards a life as a, uh, as, a, as a mental patient. Now, Thomas Insel is the former director of NIMH, and here's what he said. Look at this. It's a pretty safe bet in most of medicine that if you treat more people, death and disability drop. But when it comes to mental illness, there are more people getting more treatment than ever, yet death and disability continue to rise. How can more treatment be associated with worse outcomes? Well, if you have treatment that increases the chronicity of disorders and uh, increases the likelihood that people remain symptomatic and functionally impaired, and you treat more people with those treatments, by the way, those are the outcomes in the aggregate. There are some people who do well on drugs. That shows up in the that shows up in the research as well. You just have to compare it to what is the natural capacity to recover. If that's so, if that is the long-term effect of treatments, probably due to oppositional tolerance and this sort of impairment of normal functioning, then you would expect to get worse outcomes. That becomes an explanation for what we're seeing. Now, Thomas Insult said, oh, it's not the drugs. It's we're not providing enough social support. But if you look what we just saw, you see this bottom line about the disease model of care. You see, A, it's based on a, 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 a false narrative, a narrative that these drugs fix chemical imbalances in the brain and that these are dis discrete illnesses. And B, that the drugs are very safe and effective. And by fixing those chemical imbalances, they improve long-term outcomes. And then when we go to the outcomes literature, what we see over and over again is that disorders have worsened in the modern era compared to what might be called the natural capacity to recover. So, at the very beginning, I said this, do we keep on doing what we were doing or do we do something radically different? Now, as a society, basically, we're still doing what we've been doing and everybody knows we're now in this mental health crisis. There may be many reasons for that, but we're still relying on that disease model um, to sort of respond to the crisis. And we're not even paying attention to maybe it's the disease model that is triggering the crisis. 
But what I'm saying to you here today and asking you is, do you think we need a new narrative for mental health, a new way of thinking about psychiatric disorders and distress? I think we do. And I think it starts with, hum rather than the sort of the certainty, the arrogance that, that we hear from psychiatry, oh, we made these great advances, we understand the bio we're understanding the biology, mental disorders, blah, blah, blah. I think we need to go back and adopt a, a, a sense of humility. And that is the human mind is a mystery. So it's the most complex thing as we all know in the, in the universe. Second, we need, we need to go back and we see this in our literature. We see it in our religious texts. You see it in medical texts. Um, you see it in uh, theater. Human beings suffer. It's, it's within our human normalcy to be jealous, to be sad, to be hyperactive, to be manic. We are very emotional creatures. And we can have the, you know, we can have hallucinations, we can hear voices. The human mind is a very complex, and I would say difficult place many times. Now, what you all, but at the same time, the, the, what is so gorgeous about the human being is how responsive we are to our environment. That's why, that's in essence, our genetic makeup is designed to make us uh, responsive to our environment. So, if we want to reconceptualize things, we have to say environment matters. And if you once you come to that environment matters, what do you see? There's so many pathways to psychiatric difficulties. There are physical illnesses that cause psychotic problems, uh, that cause psychiatric problems. Parkinson's disease does. Syphilis, in stage syphilis used to cause psychosis. So there's all sorts of physical, brain inflammation causes, I mean, inflammation of the brain causes, can cause psychosis, et cetera. So there's, physical illnesses, there's environmental toxins, social stresses, poverty, trauma, family difficulties, loss, socialization, lack of meaning in life, inequality, use of illicit drugs, prescribed medications, poor diet, lack of exercise, etc. All of these in some ways tell us of alternative ways of thinking about how we end up mad, depressed, anxious, manic, uh, hyperactive in school. But if we, we need to sort of renormalize this, this is what happens to human beings so often given their different environments. And once you have this, you can start saying, well, if we change the environment, what are the chances of actually helping people regain their, 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 their well-being? And this is a beautiful statement, I think, by Harry Solomon and Sanborn Bachoven, who were psychi Massachusetts psychiatrists in 1940s, 50s, 60s, and so forth. History tells us that major mental discourse may be ep episodic in kind. And here's what they write. And I'm saying a person may go through a difficult period marked by depression or a manic episode or psychotic symptoms and then fully recover without any need for ongoing psychiatric treatment. And here's the sentence I love The majority of mental illnesses, especially the most severe, are largely self-limiting in nature if the patient is not subjected to a mean, demeaning experience or loss of rights, a loss of rights and liberties. So if we if you go back to the disease model, it's a pessimistic model. You have this abnormality, you're going to have it for life, you can be in recovery, you can never be fully recovered. This environmental story is you can have a time of difficulty. You may have an episode of disorder, but you then can, there's, there, it's, that's going to end. And you have very, very good chance of uh, resuming a very normal, or a robust life. Normal, I mean, I don't know who has a normal life. Life is up and down. But the point is you can, you can have a full life, get back to a full life. So real briefly in the time that's remaining, I thought I'd go through some older models of, of environmental care and see what older models produced. And then look at um, some newer models and see what sort of, that are really based on this environmental idea and see what sort of uh, possibilities they're glimpsing or outcomes they're showing, okay? 
So in the last years of the 18th century, Quakers in York, England, uh, said they were going to reconceptualize uh, madness. The prevailing idea at this time was a biological matter, that it was a biological illness, madness. Well, that's not, there was, there were some biological conceptions, but there were also some conception was, the conception was this, that the mad, by virtue of having lost their reason, had descended to a lower level of being and therefore needed to be treated harshly almost like animals and whether it was biological in the united states it was the idea was that it was caused by too much blood to the brain or whether it was spiritual that sort of thing the point was was the thought was people mad people were no longer really fully human and you'd, you'd see people being whipped you'd see be people uh naked in, in cells that are with with um with straw in them and then you would see people chained up the quakers in york said we reject that conception of the man as be, having dis, descended to a lower level of being we're going to conceive of them as brethren as like us as children of god and we're going to see that as children of god they have a god capa god given capacity to recover and if they don't recover we still have a social obligation to make their lives as comfortable as possible. And this, they, they did this after one of their members was put in the Bedlam hospital and, uh, and chained up and died. So they're gonna reconceive them along this idea, of these are brethren, they're not, they're not the other. And they built a retreat in York, New York, in York, England, where ba basically the idea was they'll, they'll dress like normal people, the rooms will be well appointed. They'll eat like four times a day. They'll have a glass of sherry. They'll exercise. There'll be reading rooms. There'll be dances. And that nature, they'll go out for walks in nature. The idea is that nature can be healing. But the biggest thing is, the idea is we'll hold up to the mad person a mirror that does not reflect a, a, an image of a mad person unable to be with society, but rather reflect back a picture of someone who's well-dressed, and can be with others and can sort of gain control over their selves. So what sort of outcomes did they get with this model of care? 70% of patients who had been ill less than 12 months before coming to York retreat recovered and did not relapse into illness for, for you know, during this period of time of study. And even 25% of patients who had been chronically ill before coming to re retreat recovered and did not relapse. So that was in England. And then what happened after this sort of success in England is Quakers in the United States began opening asylums based on this same idea of you would build a small place out in the countryside. Now, one of the first larger ones was Worcester Asylum in Massachusetts. And they did a big, big study of this, of all the patients discharged from 1833 to 1846. Now they go back in the 1880s they look at those patients and they find that 58% remained well throughout their lives. 7% relapsed, went back to the hospital, but subsequently recovered and returned to the community. And there were 35% that became chronically ill or died while still mentally ill. So what do you see there? Look at this number, about 65% actually living okay in the community, right? Here were outcomes of Pennsylvania Hospital, which also adopted this Quake, which was founded by Quakers and run by Quakers, and what were their outcomes of over 8,000 insane patients? 45% discharge is cured, 25% discharge is improved, so that's about 70% getting well. By the way, if you go back and look at the case, uh, this, the, the patient descriptions of patients coming into these, uh, moral, that was called moral therapy, moral therapy asylums, they're really disturbed. These are very disturbed people. So it's not that they were not so ill. They were clearly people who could no longer function within society, came to these retreats at a time of respite, spite, and so many of them got better and then could return to society. Now, maybe when they returned, they were still strange. They still struggled in some way. But remember, there's no social, there's so no social net 
services net that allows that that's going to pay them to be for food, that sort of thing. So when they are discharged, they're marrying, they're having families, they're working, that sort of thing. Now, those were the Quaker outcomes. Then what happens is in the late 1880s, we get eugenic ideas take hold about the mentally ill in the United States. And now instead of thinking of them as brethren, as like us, which is what the Quakers were encouraging us to do, they were seen as having bad genes. And because of their, and by the way, it was said to be a recessive single gene disorder, madness. You could, you could, you, if you, if you had, so you get one gene, from, one insanity gene from your father, a same gene from your mother. At that point, since it's a recessive disorder, so was the thought, you would be a carrier of the insane gene, but you wouldn't be insane. That's when you got the insane gene from both parents that you became insane. Anyway, under these ideas, we passed laws that said, oh, we have to sterilize the mentally ill and we have to put them in the hospital and keep them there so they don't, if we're not sterilizing them, so we, they don't have children. So what's again, instead of seeing as a brethren, we're seeing them as a threat, as genetic defects, and that takes, and during this time, we get all sorts of very aggressive somatic therapies, lobotomies, electroshock. And one of the reasons that lobotomy, lobotomy became popularized in the 1940s was the thought that these people, hospitalized patients, they really have no value, that they were just a threat to society. So if you, if you made them quieter and induced sort of a quiet dement, that was seen as, uh, as a benefit. So, but then the Nazis adopted, of course, eugenic ideas about the mentally ill. They began killing the mentally ill even before they began killing, uh, the Holocaust began with killing of the mentally ill in Germany. And so in 1945, eugenic ideas about the mentally ill were seen as associated with Nazism by and large. And at the same time with that eugenic idea disappearing, where you have to keep people in the mental hospital because A, they have a genetic disorder and B, they could have bad genes, you don't want them to have kids, there's a switch. And now the idea is we should try to get people out of the hospital. And so what do we see in this decade following World War II and up to 1955, which is when antipsychotics were introduced, what sort of discharge rates do you see for psychotic patients. Well, Warren, 62% were discharged within 12 months. At Delaware State Hospital, 85% were discharged by the end of five years. And then what are their stay well rates? In the Warren State Hospital, 73% were living in the community in the three years. Delaware Hospital, 70% were living in the community six years or more after initial hospitalization. You remember this, 70%. Remember this, 65%. Now, what are you seeing from 45 to 45 to 55? 65, 70% have a time of psychosis, get discharged, and are able to live in the community, uh, you know, three, five years later. And this is before we had, uh, you know, um, disability payments. So people are working, et cetera. Now, antipsychotics are introduced in the 1955. California does a big study of first episode patients. Look at the discharge rate for those treated without neuroleptics at the end of 18 months, 88%. It's actually higher than for those treated with neuroleptics. The researchers concluded that drug-treated patients tend to have longer periods of hospitalization. Untreated patients consistently show a somewhat low, low retention rate. For our purposes here today, the importance is people are getting better without schizophrenia patients, without use of drugs, this was the relapse rate in a study that compared uh, people treated in 1947, looked at their outcomes five years later versus those treated in 67 with drugs. Look at the 47 cohort. 76% were successfully living in the community in the five years. 1967 cohort, they're much more socially dependent. So look at what I've done here is a chart on, oh, by the way, I see the participants raised hand. We'll get to the questions in just a second, okay? But just look at the good outcomes without use of antipsychotics for patients diagnosed as insane, schizophrenic, or psychotic. York Retreat, 70%. Worcester Asylum, 65. Pennsylvania Hospital, 45 to 70. Warren, 73, 70, 76. I didn't do this. 
Norway had a thing, 63%. California, 88%. So this is telling you the, of the possibility of recovery from psychosis in the absence of neuroleptic. If you don't see it as a chronic disorder for everybody, there was a World Health Organization cross-cultural studies in the 1970s, 1980s. This compared outcomes in three developing countries, India, Nigeria, and Colombia with outcomes in the US and other developed countries. One study was uh, two years in length, the other was five years. In each study, those in the developing countries had a considerably better course. Researchers concluded that being in a developed country was a strong predictor of not attaining a complete remission. Those in the poor countries, exceptionally good social outcomes. And here was the difference in medication usage. In the developing countries, they were, the drugs were used acutely, but not chronically. Whereas in the rich countries, the developed countries, that was the standard of care. In other words, worse outcomes associated in countries that use the drugs long-term. They go back at 15 to 20 years. In the developing countries, where people aren't remained, weren't uh, re re maintained on, on antipsychotics, 53% were never psychotic anymore and 73% were employed. That's not far off from, from what Harrow saw in his study. Then there was the Lauren Mosher Soteria Project. This was a study designed in the 1970s. And the idea of Lauren Mosher was the head of schizophrenic studies at the NIMH. He became belief that many people could get better with the proper environment. So he demedicalized it. It was a study, randomized study. Uh, newly diagnosed patients were either treated in the hospital normally with drugs, or they were taken to a house that was staffed by ordinary people where they would just live with the people. And in the house, they would not be put on antipsychotics right away. But if people uh, felt to improve or deteriorated, then they would be put on the drugs, on antipsychotics. You see it ran for 10 years. 179 patients. At the end of six weeks, the diminishment of psychotic symptoms was were same in the group treated with antipsychotics as those randomized to the house. Those randomized to the house in the two years had lower psychopathology scores, fewer readmissions, and better global adjustments. Look at the antipsychotic use. 42% never exposed, 39% used them temporarily, 19 regularly. Soteria is a model for selective use of the drugs. Now in Northern Finland, that's a model they adopted in 19, early 1990s with a form of care called open dialogue. The idea was with this conception was madness or schizophrenia doesn't happen in the brain of the individual, but rather in the in-between spaces of people and that the psychotic person bears the burden of making known of disruptions in this inner space. So the idea is you have to repair that those uh, relationships with family, with friends, with society. And that if you can, what you really need to do is to help the person who's psychotic gain a new narrative where they can be in, in, they can be with others in the world and they can have a positive sort of hopeful idea of returning to a normal life. And here's how antipsychotics, they weren't put on antipsychotics right away. If after a period of time, they weren't getting a better quote grip on life, then they would be used be put on an antipsychotic low dose. And then at, for those put on an antipsychotic at the end of six months, they would see who can come off the drug and who needs to be on the drug long-term. So here was the antipsychotic usage in five years, 67% never used the drugs, 13% for a period of time, 20% continual use and look at the outcomes. 67% never relapsed during five years, 79% asymptomatic at five years, 73% working or back in school, only 20% on disability. If you go to this part of Finland, when they were doing this in Northern Finland, they said, once we adopted this approach, which, which became an environmental approach with selective use of the drugs, we saw the long-term course of schizophrenia completely change away from a chronic disorder into a much more symptom episodic disorder for so many people. And you'll see here, look at those who didn't use antipsychotics in the first two years. It, basically 85% were well at the end of two years. 
I mean, I have five years, excuse me. So what you see here quite clearly is that if you can get people through a first episode of psychosis without using antipsychotics, that can lead to a really good outcome from a high percentage of people. And also, if you just use them selectively and, and sort of for a shorter period of time, that will also help a group of people do well over the long term. And then only a small percentage will really uh, end up chronically ill. With this knowledge of this literature becoming known in Norway, the health minister, in response to user groups, declared, this goes back to 2014, I think, said, I want all our health districts, there's four in Norway, to start setting aside beds for medication-free treatment for patients who do not want to be put on psychiatric drugs. These were representatives of the user groups that made it happen. Now, there is a ward in the north part of Norway, in Tromso, Norway, which is dedicated to medication-free treatment, and it's psychotic patients there. And this is what one of the people say. The people who come here don't want medication. This is their deepest wish. We say, you can come to us. We want you as you are. Come to us with your delusions, your illness, your thoughts and feelings and history. Everything is good. We can meet them as they are. When people experience that, something essential happens. It takes away to the, the mistrust and the fear and says to the person, this is okay. And then the person can start growing. That is the most important thing. By the way, I went there. I visited this ward, spent a few days there. There are psychotic people, but they're, they, they're free to leave anytime and go into the town and shop. Um, it, it's, it's an active place. There's still people struggling. Uh, some people came in, they were on drugs and are tapering down, but it's a, a very sort of a live place. People are playing music. It's very different if, than when you go to a hospital where people are heavily medicated and basically just sitting around. You'll see here, this is the psychiatrist who really did this. Uh, he was one of the supporters that made it happen. And then basically he created this ward. And what he's finding out as patients go off, they report that when they taper, they get problems back, but they find new ways to deal with them. These people have a very strong feeling about getting their emotions back. And this is also experienced by their families. One woman told us, I thought I lost my husband four years ago, and now he's back. So this is showing what's possible. Uh, this is the director. It's a new way of thinking before when people wanted help, it was always on the basis of what the hospitals wanted and not on what the patients wanted. We were used to saying to patients, this is what is best for you. But we are now saying to them, what do you really want? And they can say, I am free, I can decide. This is another one in Basel where they're taking people off in Norway at a different hospital. And basically they're finding that even with chronic patients, about two, about at least half they can get medication free. And some of those who've been chronic uh, completely recover. Just to finish this, there's now in Israel, uh, Soteria homes being set up. The man leading this is Pesach Lichtenberg. He met Lauren Mosher. At one point he was uh, the psychiatrist in Israel responsible for getting hospitals to use the new atypical antipsychotic medications. He saw that wasn't so great. And he started uh, the Soteria project model on the Soteria house in the US. And these, uh, they're sometimes called Soteria houses or equalizing houses. The Israeli uh, Ministry of Health has uh, supported this initiative. There's uh, insurance reimbursement now for this form of care. Uh, so what you see in Israel is this experiment with this other way of helping people who are in severe distress, including psychotic distress. Um, I'll, give, I, I'll give you an example of how they dealt with, um, I also visited these houses when in Israel and one house, for example, was a house just for women. And there was a woman there who said, she came in and she thought she got raped each night. Men came into her room and raped her. So what did they do there? They didn't say, oh, that's not true. We're watching you. They said, okay, can you find a room here in the house where you will be safe from the men? She picked out a room. And once she was able to pick out the room, that, 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 that fear, that experience of being raped at night disappeared. It's an example of a, a different humane approach. You'll see many people either when I was there off medication or tapering down. And just like 
the ward uh, in Norway, it's a very active place. People are very engaged. It's, it's, it's not that people are all better, but it's it's there's sort of almost a joy of, of, of being there in these sort of very active places. Now, you hearing voice is an example of reconceptualizing thing, the hearing voices networks where they say it's okay to have voices. And the whole point is we'll learn to live with them. Some people even like their voices. You have respite houses in the United States coming up. But what I want to show you with these last two slides is the calls for a revolution in mental health care, a rethinking is now coming from the very highest sort of organizations, prestigious organization. This is from Danius Puris, UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health. What does he write? The urgent need for a shift in approach should prioritize policy innovation at the population level, targeting social determinants and abandon the predominant medical model that seeks to cure individuals by targeting disorders. That's from the UN Special Rapporteur for Health. And then in 2021, you see that the World Health Organization issued new guidance and think just, you read it yourselves, but a fundamental shift within the mental health field is required in order to end this current situation. We need to rethink everything. So we began this talk, this discussion with a question. Should we keep on doing what we've been doing? That's the disease model. And you see the public health outcomes are worsened, the long-term outcomes of different disorders have worsened. We're seeing more and more of a burden on our society. And we see that the whole form of care is based on a false narrative of medical advance. And yet, if we go back through history, and, and, and that current thing characterizes the problem within the head of the individual as a chronic abnormality. But if we go back before that, what do we see in our conceptions and literature and religious texts and everywhere is that human beings, they do struggle with their minds. It's very possible for them to become depressed, manic, psychotic, hear voices, all those things. But that's within our makeup, and we also, it's potentially within our makeup. And we also see that human beings are so responsive to their environment. That's what we're bent to be physical environment, social environment, uh, you know, yeah, e equality, all these sort of things. So if we have that conception of human beings, we can say, well, maybe what we should do different is try to create more nurturing environments. And when people do struggle and fall into difficult situations, what sort of environment can we create for them? Housing, that sort of thing that can help them provide meaning in life and also develop a narrative for going forward where they can sort of be with other people and be well in other people. How can we give them a new narrative? And so that I think is the choice for us as a society that is being presented to us today. All right, I went a few minutes over. I was supposed to be done at 10.30. So at least we have about 25 minutes for questions and discussions. And I'm not sure if someone is going to, I'll go in. I, I don't I'm, know. I'm back. Robert. Oh, good. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Robert, for that, that very informative presentation. Um, it's very uh, enlightening to see how the system works and where we are with all these medications. Um, and, and how they've been kind of uh, foisted on us. So um, we're now going to begin the Q&A. And uh, I just want to go over a few things with, with the group. But uh, Robert, I believe you have a book, um, if I'm correct. Where where would someone um, go about getting your book? Yeah, the books are easy. More, most easily, you can purchase them from Amazon or some other online vendor. I mean, there's they've been published a while back, so the bookstores often don't have them. But the books are a yeah, there they are: Anatomy of an Epidemic, Mad in America, On the Lapse of God, Psychiatry and the Influence, The Maker's Wife. Those are the books I've published. And right. Psychiatry and the Influence, I, I co-published, co-wrote with Lisa Cosgrove. All right, and do you have a, a website or so this right here just for the audience this is our uh our website if you you can buy it through uh the real truth about health and um 
And I believe it actually goes through Amazon, but will like a small donation will give, be given back to support the Real Truth About Health Conference. And um, and then how about a website and uh, any sort of social media so people can follow? So after I wrote Anatomy of an Epidemic, which looked at these long-term outcomes, a lot of people said, oh, we need to do something different. We need to think about this. So I started a web magazine called Mad in America. And basically what we do on Mad in America is we provide daily science reports. And go back to what I was just speaking about. What we're doing is showing what the real science is, and it's out of sync with the public narrative. Okay. So that's why we have daily science reports. We have blogs written by an international group of writers that are both talking about what has gone wrong with the, the current paradigm of care and also exploring what could be different. Um, and then we have personal stories because one of the things that uh, the disease model said was, oh, we can't listen to people who are psychotic because they lack insight into their illness or people with bipolar. And that's a recipe for bad medicine when you don't listen to people who are being diagnosed. So we have personal stories of, about their struggles, about what it was like to be treated, what how they got well. And then we do continuing education courses. We do town halls. Uh, we have radio podcasts. And just to give you an example of how this, there's really a global movement now for rethinking psychiatry. We now have a, affiliates in 11 countries, and we have more four more affiliates coming online in the summer. So there's really a national grassroots movement to really rethink this disease model and, and come up with a holistic model that really remembers what we are as human beings, which is, you know, we're responsive to our environments. Great. So um, as we begin the, the uh, live Q&A session, I just want to go over a few things for the audience. We don't take any questions directly from chat. What we do is um, you need to raise your hand in Zoom. And if you're not familiar with that, in order to do that, you go to the bottom of the Zoom window. Second from the right, you'll find the reactions button. You'll click on that and click on the raise hand function. When I call on you, please just state where you're from and state your question. And um, if we, we just ask that all questions are brief and on topic. And with that, I, I want to go ahead and ask you a, a, a question myself. So you've written... Um, you, you've written about the role of institutional power and financial interests in shaping mental health policy. What are some so what are some examples of how these forces have influenced our approach to mental illness and how can we work to counter these influences? Well, the best example really is how the pharmaceutical industry promoted the chemical imbalance story, but with the cooperation of, of you know psychiatrists and the American Psychiatric Association. And so what you see, is once the American Psychiatric Association adopted this disease model and basically promoted it around the world, the pharmaceutical company said, ah, oh, this is great. We'll start paying money to academic psychiatrists and to the APA to promote this new model, but we'll also pay academic psychiatrists to be our, our thought leaders, consultants, investigators on our trials, authors of our trials, and then we'll pay them to give and we'll give money to them to speak at, you know, dinners and conferences and that sort of thing. So what happened in the 1980s, we say the pharmaceutical industry captured academic psychiatry and academic psychiatry. You even said we're entering a partnership. The APA said entering a partnership with the drug companies. And so what you have is, is industry money helping to fund and promote a story that was born of guild interests. And that's why we organized ourselves around this false narrative. And that's why we got this explosion in the use of drugs and diagnoses is because there was this merging of commercial interests with guild interests and money flowed from the commerce part to the, to the members of the guild. And that's why we ended up with a false narrative. And by the way, so if you think about this from a capitalistic point of view, this was a very successful story, you know, Capital, you know, capitalism, <laughs> country, you know, corporations try to build markets for their products, right? That's what they do. And they, the pharmaceutical industry did a great job of building markets for psychiatric drugs. Somewhere between 20 and 25% of Americans now take a psychiatric drug on a daily basis. That's a story of a corporate success. And if you go into our colleges, somewhere between 20 to 25% of our kids now, freshmen, arrive with a diagnosis and a prescription. And drug use is just out of control in the colleges. Now, 
for the health of the kids, that's a that's a tragedy. For the, the kids growing up within this environment, it's a tragedy because they're being turned into psychiatric patients as kids. But from a corporate point of view, that's the creation of a market. So I hope I'm answering your question, but yes, you cannot understand this story unless you understand the profit motive. And if you're if you if you go from 800 million to 40 billion dollars in a market for psychiatric drugs in 20 years, wow, that's a success story. No, you definitely answered my question. So, how do you respond to critics who argue that your views are uh, on um, psychiatric medications are overly pessimistic, and that these drugs have helped many people with mental illness um, lead more stable lives, you know, and, and fulfilling lives? How do you counter that? That's a great question. It's very simple. What does your research show? What do NIMH funded studies show? This is not my research. It's not my claims. I'm just the messenger here. I'm looking at wh what were your outcomes in the STAR-D study? 3% were well at the end of one year. Now they hid that data from the public because it was so bad, but this is what eventually came out and was acknowledged as true. Have, what are the experts saying about the change in the course of bipolar disorder? It's gotten worse. That's their data. Martin Harrow's study, that was an NIMH funded study to look at long-term course of schizopsychotic disorders. What did they conclude? I'm just the messenger. So the point is, this is your research. And here's the important thing is, can you show me research rather than just complain about me where your drugs are improving the course of depression, improving the course of bipolar disorder, improving the course of schizophrenia, improving public health outcomes, lowering the burden of, of, of illness, and they can't do it. Instead, we hear, oh, it's helped people live so many great lives. Well, okay, some people do okay on the drugs. It's true. But what are the outcomes in the aggregate? And what does NIMH-funded research show? Because it's really NIMH studies and these epidemiological studies that really bring this alive. I am just a reporter reporting on that research. And as part of what I did, I tried to see is, is there any research that contradicts this? Is there a long-term study that said, oh, here, the medication people are doing great, so much better than the other? I can't find it. And uh, Mad 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 came up in 2010. I had a lot of critics. No one has pointed out a study that shows long-term benefit. And in fact, a, a, a man named Nasir Gami, very prominent psychiatrist, recently published a paper said, these papers don't cure any, these drugs don't cure any disease. There's no evidence they provide a long-term benefit. We should be using them short-term and as low as doses as possible, which is basically what I was saying in 2010. So that's the long-winded answer to your question. Great answer. All right, Elizabeth, where are you from and what's your question? Uh, Elizabeth from Quebec, Canada. So very interesting uh, conference. Um, I was wondering if uh, what was what were your thoughts on the inflammation process in the brain to um, generate psychiatric problems? Actually, with the uh, with the increasing inflammation going on since the last uh, fifty years and increasing psychiatric diagnosis. Also, I was wondering uh, if it was. Uh, a hypothesis to consider? Oh, yeah, this and I think that's a great question. And I want to make it clear is I, there are biological pathways to psychiatric difficulties, okay? In other words, physical health is going to often manifest, if you have illnesses, they can manifest in psychiatric difficulties, okay? And it makes perfect sense. We're mind-body machines, so to speak. Mind doesn't exist over here in the body over here. Yeah, I, I think this is actually... Uh, I don't think inflammation is the only cause or anything like that. It's, 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 but is it a pathway to psychiatric difficulties? Clearly it can be. Brain inflammation in particular, but you know, if, if you have sort of a general, you know, autoimmune responses, that sort of thing, uh, and inflammatory triggers, that's not a healthy environment. And if people are suffering from autoimmune disorders and suffering from inflammatory difficulties, it would make sense uh, as to why this would lead to psychiatric problems. So I think that's a great line of investigation for actually having sort of um, 
a, a, a drug response to the problems. If you can really see if someone is suffering from, say, inflammation of the brain or an inflammatory difficulty, if you can somehow bring that under control with some sort of agent, uh, that has a very good chance of uh, helping to uh, uh, alleviate those problems. And there's a new book out that talks about mitochondrial functioning and all, um, and, and, and how once mitochondrial functioning, and I think inflammation plays a role into this, becomes compromised, you can get things like depression, et cetera. So it's, I really believe that biological explorations are really important in the inflammation pathway is an important one to investigate it, and probably one of the most promising ones in terms of finding uh, treatments that really help ameliorate those who are suffering in that way. Thank you. Right. Thank you. And um, in your book, Anatomy of an Epidemic, you argue that psychiatric uh, psychiatric medications may be doing more harm than good. Um, what led you to that conclusion and what evidence supports that position? Well, I mean, first of all, the disability numbers start with that. I mean, we had this extraordinary rise in the number of people on disability due to mental illness. In 1987, which is when Prozac comes to market, there were about 1.2 million receiving a disability payment due to a psychiatric disorder. By the time in 2013, it was around 5 million people. That's a fourfold increase. But doing more harm than good, well, yeah. So, I mean, you see all these public health measures getting worse, okay? You see the burden of mental illness going worse. But also, if you're worsening the course of disorders, you're lowering recovery rates of depression, manic depressive illness, or bipolar illness, um, lowering schizophrenia recovery rates, that's doing more harm than good. Because you're, it, it, even go back to Hippocrates. Hippocrates says, do no harm. Well, what he was saying is that often there's a capacity to recover in nature. And if your intervention doesn't improve on that capacity to recover, you're doing harm. So let's say you have an illness where you give them, people come in, they have an illness, 50% recover and 50% stay the same. No one goes worse. You'd say, you're the doctor, oh, I'm not doing harm. But what happens if the natural recovery rate is 80% recovered and the remaining 20% just stayed the same. Well, you've lowered your recovery rate, therefore you're doing harm. And so that is what shows in the research literature is we're, we're lowering recovery rates, we're increasing the public health burden with psychiatric, and all this is associated with the regular use of psychiatric drugs. So that's a story of a paradigm of care, drug-based paradigm of care that is doing more harm than good. Great. And you just mentioned about um, uh, declines in the recovery rate uh, for people with, with mental illness. What are the most important factors? Are there any other factors besides the introduction of these drugs? Uh, is it, you know, have we taken away support? I know like in the 80s, for example, a lot of the uh, the psychiatric institutions were, were closed. Is that at all, you know, a contribution to what's going on now? Or is is it primarily the uh, the introduction of these uh, these drugs that that aren't really working and and in often cases no no it's the whole paradigm that comes with it now one of the reasons is if you believe the drugs are fixing chemical imbalances you would say oh well maybe we don't need respite homes maybe we don't need shelters we just fix them with the drugs and we don't need to do these social supports so. That's the problem is we put all our eggs in this basket and then we, we stop thinking about the environmental supports people may, need. So if you have a more unequal society, what do you see? You see more unhappiness, okay? What do you see among impoverished people living in poverty? Well, that's very stressful. So, and why are our kids having so much trouble growing up right now, right? What the levels. Well, that isn't, you don't blame that on the kids. They're having trouble even before they get diagnosed. That's because we're not a society that's nurturing our kids in the right way. We're not providing them an environment that helps them grow up and thrive. So the drugs isolated cause a problem, but they're also part of a paradigm of thinking that uh, avoids the larger story about how do people stay well? Well, diet's important, sleep's important, Meaning in life is important. Social engagement is important. Hope for the future is important. Okay. And 
so we have right now clearly what happened with this paradigm of care is it put all the responsibility for the problem in the chemistry of the individual. The problem is located in you. What we really know is mental distress arises within within environments, within larger social environments. And the focus on the drug focus kept us from looking at these holistic conceptions of human beings and holistic ideas of how to help people, give people shelter, meaning in life. I'll give you an example. There's a group in, 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 in Connecticut. You know what they do? with and Most of these people have been in hospitals. It's called Volunteers for Psychotherapy. They say, we'll give you two hours of psychotherapy for free or, or an hour of psychotherapy for free each week. You know what you, you, what you have to do? You have to volunteer for two hours each week. So now when they volunteer, what happens? They're, no, they're getting out of their house. They're no longer the one being helped. They're helping others. They now have a sense of self of doing something meaningful, important. They're part of an organization that's maybe it's an animal shelter, delivering food to the elderly, whatever it might be. They now have a place of meaning in life. So that's an example of where you create a new environment for a person that provides meaning, socialization, that sort of thing. Add in housing, and now you have a, a start a step towards a person building a new life. So no, it's not just the drugs, but the drugs conceptualize problems as problems within the individual and they blind us to the thought is that we should be thinking about these from a societal wide perspective. Great, thank you. Our next question is coming from Bin Wu. Where are you from and what's your question? Thank you very much for your uh, excellent uh, teaching. And my question is, I come from the Maryland in the, uh, so question is how important it is to eat the gluten-free food for the, for this kind of? Well, I, I couldn't agree. You know, <laughs> we are eating machines, so to speak. <laughs> I mean, we obviously how we feel and our physical health is so tied to what we eat. And if you're eating processed foods and a lot of sugar, um, that's not what the body's really built to live on. I mean, you have carbs and that sort of thing. So as part of this sort of response that we should be thinking about, and you know, there's a lot of talk, you know, there's a lot of attention being given to this, is how do we eat, how do we grow, <laughs> how do we grow foods and raise animals that are that will in essence be turned into very healthy food, health promoting foods. And how do we have healthy diets? And, and you know, one of the things of course is if you go back 40 years ago, the nutrients, micronutrients that were in, in the food we ate was much greater than they are today because of the way we raise our like tomatoes and everything. So in answer to your question is, this is part of what we need to do as a society is we need to, you know, eat better. <laughs> And the way we can eat better, of course, is if we make a societal effort to, to grow our food in a healthy way and, and make it available. And one of the problems we have in the United States right now is good food, non-processed food is much more expensive than processed food. So if you're poor, you can get a lot of cheap carbs, which isn't good for you. But so what I'm trying to say to you is that's a great question. Food obviously is so key to our health. And health is both physical health and mental health. They go emotional health. They go they go hand in hand. And I believe her question was specifically about uh, gluten free. Does gluten play a oh, role? Oh, I missed that. I'm sorry, I didn't. Listen, uh, you know, <laughs> I have a, a granddaughter who has celiac disease, and she eats gluten free free food. And once she got it, once she got that diagnosed, and um, you know, started eating gluten free, she got much better. <laughs> So I think for people who can't, uh, you know, handle wheat, obviously gluten-free is important. I don't think gluten-free is necessarily necessary for everyone. Um, that's a larger story than anything I know about. I mean, bread has been important in, in human civilization for a long period of time. So um, it's actually interesting to me, why are we seeing so much celiac disease today? I don't know. And I don't know if it has relation to like, has wheat changed? I just don't know, or, and and why why are why are systems less able to handle certain you know wheat foods? So I don't know the I don't know the answer to that question is. But if something's making you sick, then it makes sense to stop eating it. Great. 
Our next question is coming from Elizabeth. Where are you from and what's your question? Um, Elizabeth, again, from Quebec, Canada. In your research, did you see anything about how to taper off psychiatric medication for people who are, who are taking it in the long term? You said that it was very difficult for For those people to stop it, uh, they would be uh, uh, they would necessitate necessitate the medication for their lifetime. But did you see anything about that about so, stopping the medication uh, like slowly? We just or? have two minutes left, Robert. Just okay. So. I, I want to be real quick on this. Um, some people have difficulty coming off. Okay, some people can come off, and and all the different drugs. Well, especially antipsychotics and antidepressants, without that much trouble. But there are many people that have very difficult times. And we're also discovering we can have what's called protracted withdrawal symptoms. And that's related to the fact of your brain not renormalizing. So now there is a lot of attention focusing on how can you taper from drugs and how can you do it successfully? And then there's models for doing it slowly. The problem is, and I have found something called the International Institute for Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal, which the purpose was to understand better what is happening physiologically, and can we develop protocols that help people get off the drug successfully, those who want to get off. And what we're finding out now is basically a spectrum of, of things. Some people get off okay, and actually fairly rapidly. Some people get off okay with a slow taper. Other people, they get off, but they have these protracted with, withdrawal symptoms that are really vexing for long periods of time indefinite periods of time. And then there's a group of people that just can't get off that it's just so difficult for them. So in answer to your question, there's still so much that is unknown about the drug withdrawal process because researchers never, you know, there was no motivation to study it, but it is being brought to attention. As I said, I helped found this thing called the International Institute for Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal. It's being recognized as a problem. But one of the recognitions is that that these drugs can be a trap and people may have real trouble coming off and getting back medication-free lives. And that should be uh, incorporated into the risk benefit, you know, consent process right at the beginning when you go off. But just final thing is, I don't want to leave people with a very pessimistic message saying that everybody who's on psychiatric medications will never be able to get off and resume, you know, a drug-free life. That's not true. Many, many people get off and do well. Right. And just with like a, a, a like a 10 second answer, are do doctors make patients aware of the risks of going on these drugs and how it may actually make them depend on the drugs for the rest of their lives? No. Okay. That was a great quick answer. And I appreciate that, Robert. And with that, we come to the end of our, our Q&A. Robert, thank you so much for, for all the information that you shared. It, it, it's really important for people to know this. Uh, we can unmute the audience, please. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Sorry for the difficulty. Yeah.